I'm joined by Sergio Kleinerman, uh, who is the Eugene Higgins Professor of Mathematics at Princeton, where he's been teaching since 1987, uh, and who has been uh, quite outspoken lately about some issues uh, pertaining to the university and to uh, our society in general. Welcome, Sergio. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, it's nice to be with you. Thank you so much for coming on. Um, I mean, we, we have another thing in common. We're both Romanian, uh, and we've also uh, been living in the West for a, a, good, a good portion of our lives. Um, this is um, an, a very interesting conversation because it seems that a lot of people from either Eastern Europe or people who come up from outside the West sometimes have uh, an, an easier perception on the dysfunctions that that are happening in, in current society. And you're someone who's, um, who's been born under communism, has lived under communism in Romania for a long time, then went to the West at a, at a relatively young age, and then has been living in the West for probably the, the better part of your life at this point. Uh, but still, you, you see, see the dysfunction. I'm, I'm curious, what, what was the moment or what was the, the buildup that, that made you decide to speak out about, about the issues that you were seeing? Because, yeah, you, you've been there for a long time, and it seems that... Yes. Yeah, yeah, no, it's, a, it's actually an interesting, an interesting topic. So I, uh, obviously, I, when I came to United States, I didn't know much about American society. I didn't know much about the internal American politics. Uh, but I was very interested, of course, in anything that had to do with international politics, I mean, the attitudes of various politicians relative to West, to Eastern Europe and Soviet Union and China and so on and so forth. And of course, I was very critical of any, any kind of uh, attitude, which was, uh, I consider as being weak relative to Eastern Europe, relative to uh, Soviet Union. Uh, so uh, I, I don't consider myself uh, either Republican or Democrat, but I kind of uh, gravitated from the very beginning towards Republicans, uh, Republican, say, politicians, because of their attitude towards, uh, towards Soviet Union and uh, Eastern Europe. Uh, but uh, with time, of course, I, I became aware of also of, uh, internal issues uh, that have to do with the relationship between, between conservatism and, uh, and progressivism. <laughs> You know, people who want more and more government versus people who really believe uh, in uh, in a federalist society, uh, federal uh, states, power of the states, and uh, and relatively little <clears throat> action by the federal government, limited powers as given by the constitution, and so on and so forth. Uh, so I became a conservative in that sense, uh, believing in in sort of conservative principles. Uh, and, uh, but I was not, uh, clearly not, I mean, I, uh, I was always intellectually interested in these issues, but I never participated, I never wrote anything. I didn't participate in, uh, any action until relatively late, uh, in, uh, about five or five years ago, uh, when, um, I became interested in the, a group which was formed by Robert George at Princeton University, which is a, a group of conservatives. At least at the beginning, it was a group of conservatives uh, and uh, uh, who were extremely worried about issues of academic freedom. So for example, I, I, I spearheaded, it's so my first action in the United States uh, was uh, in 2015 when, uh, we, the Princeton faculty adopted a, a statement affirming the university's uh, commitment to academic freedom, to the principle of academic freedom expressed in, in the University of Chicago principles, uh, as they are called. And I, I kind of was a, the person who spearheaded the initiative, but it was in the name of this group of people who was really led by Robbie George. Uh, so this was my first, uh, first time that I did something. But again, uh, uh, I was a mathematician. I, I mean, everything I wrote was, you know, mathematical papers. I just finished, in fact, an 800-page uh, paper right now. So I feel very good about it. Uh, but uh, uh, little by little, I became more and more worried. And of course, uh, in particular, after the, the George Floyd's death in May last year, uh, 
I started to see a lot of these functions. Uh, and uh, in particular, I was, I was really struck by the July 4th letter. I don't know if you know, there was this letter at Princeton University written by, by a large number of uh, faculty uh, who were uh, asking for measures, uh, 27 or 28, if I remember, to combat structural racism at uh, Princeton University. Structural racism at Princeton University. I mean, the, you know, the, the very statement is, uh, to me, was uh, absolutely inconceivable. Uh, so, you know, they're asking all sorts of things like uh, rewarding visible work done by faculty of color, color with course relief and summer salary. So, you know, things that really go against the principle of, of, uh, of treating everybody equally, independent of color. Uh, provide additional human resources for the support of junior faculty of color. Estab establish a, a core distribution requirement focused on the history and legacy of racism. So assuming that racism really exists and in, in the country and on the campus. Acknowledge, credit, and incentivize anti-racist student activism. So, in other words, uh, really uh, give a lot of a lot of power uh, to to such groups. Uh, and the worst of this is was to constitute a committee. I mean, this this really is uh, is or Orwellian. Constitute a committee composed entirely of faculty that would oversee the investigation and discipline of racist behaviors, incidents research, so racism in research and publication on the part of the faculty. So, I mean, if you can imagine, I mean, this is yeah. Princeton University and you hear such. Uh, so, uh, so that, that's a moment when I really became interested in, uh, uh, in uh, yeah. Have you some kind of uh, writings. So I, I started to write, so there the, the were, yeah, sorry, I, uh, I apologize. Sorry. No worries. No, it's um, just wondering if you've seen uh, things happen specifically in, in your field of mathematics or is, was this kind of a, a, a university wide initiative and how did that manifest in, in day to day? Was it implemented or was it just uh, something that was presented and then nothing was? No, no. So, the, 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 you know, not all departments in the universities are uh, equally uh, affected by this nonsense. Uh, so some are a lot, and uh, particularly, for example, the classics where this professor, I don't know if you know the story of Professor Katz, uh, who was, uh, anyway, I can say a few words about it because it's a very interesting story. Mm -hmm. uh, so he was a professor of classics and, uh, and uh, he wrote uh, uh, in July 8, so following this July 4th letter, uh, he, he wrote uh, an article in Quillet, which uh, he calls it a Declaration of Independence. Uh, by a Princeton professor. So, uh, and the only thing that he did, so he, he talks about exactly this issue. So he had a lot of issues with exactly the same thing that I have uh, with these measures, in particular, the last one that uh, I mentioned. And, uh, but uh, in the process, he calls the Black Justice League, which was a student activist group. So this is in the context of what I said earlier that, uh, this letter was asking for all sorts of activities, I mean, to allow uh, activities by students. In, in. So, so this was actually a group that, uh, that was pretty, uh, pretty a, lot, a lot of terrible things. Anyway, he calls it a terrorist organization. And this led to a huge buhaha in, on the campus and he was condemned and the president wrote something about him. Uh, and uh, there was even talk about about uh, doing legal, taking legal action against him. I mean, take not legal action, taking uh, administrative action against him. His his uh, department really uh, condemned him uh, in a in a very very serious way. Until today, he he's basically he's not somehow his students, the students that, that would like to take courses with him, are told not to because of. Of what happened. In any case, in the end, nothing, nothing terrible happened to him, particularly because there was, there was a lot of defense uh, uh, for him. Uh, anyway, uh, so uh, so you can see the, the classics department was very highly affected. There are other departments which are seriously affected. Math department is not so bad at all. In fact, I would say it's it's still okay. But of course, I'm worried about what will happen in, in the long run. So, for example, I'm actually writing right now a letter together with some other colleagues 
a letter addressed to the, which is connected, not addressed, but it's connected to the uh, American Mathematical Society. So this is a major professional organization of mathematicians in the United States. And they came up, came with a report uh, claiming again that uh, that uh, there is racism, systemic racism in mathematics in the United States, which is ridiculous. Yeah. So, uh, so we are trying to respond to that. Uh, so you start seeing signs that mathematics is also affected. Yeah, given your experience now with you know trying to kind of lead lead a more activist position in this and then getting involved in the conversations, what is your feeling about the uh, idea of being able to recapture these institutions? Do you have any faith in the idea that okay, with with a concerted effort with people stepping in, there might be a way to kind of drag these institutions back into some some form of reasonableness about this subject or is this a, a cascading effect that has to see you know has to have its cultural revolution moment and w will burn itself out through that through that direction rather than um yeah being yeah of course the cultural revolution will lead to the basically the distract destruction of uh of uh, United States ideals of academic freedom and, and independence of thought and so on and so forth. And sure, uh, who knows what will happen afterwards. Yeah, no, okay, so it, that's a, obviously a very good question. I, I hope uh, uh, the answer is yes. I mean, I see certainly more and more people who are, uh, who are uh, speaking out against, against what is going on. Uh, but on the other hand, I think what I'm worried about is that uh, the forces against it are also becoming stronger and stronger. So I, I'm not so sure that, that somehow the reaction is proportional to, the reaction that I see is proportional to the forces arrayed against, against us, let's say. It may have had, it might have been successful during the Trump administration. Now, I think with Biden, I mean, you can see the kind of things that Biden administration, the measures that they take, I'm less and less optimistic. Because yeah. the, 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 the Department of Education just came up recently with, with something again calling for uh, reform in education based on critical race theory and, uh, and on the assumption that there is systematic racism in the United States and so on and so forth. So yeah. it's very, it's, it's really very discouraging in fact. But nevertheless, we'll have to fight. Yeah, exactly. I think uh, the, the, the kind of the insidious part about this is that there is a bit of a feedback mechanism between the push and the shove of this because a, a lot of the, the critical race theory and essentially this kind of, let's call it, you know, postmodern uh, perspective on, on equity uh, is fueled by the reaction. So whenever they're like, for example, the, the January 4th uh, capital invasion, insurrection, civil war, whatever you want to call it, has been used as probably one of the biggest levers in fighting back against the other side and, you know, right, yeah. domestic terrorism, you know, creating this whole new boogeyman where in the place of Trump, because there was quite a boogeyman vacuum once Trump was out of office. So now we have, you know, the insurrectionists. And right. uh, so right. in a way, the, the fighting back is fueling the, the hydra. It's, it's kind of uh, feeding. Exactly. Feed. Exactly. It's, exactly. it's very exactly. hard to fight back. Yes. Uh, no, it's correct. Yeah. And, and of course, uh, I mean, what happened uh, in January and the reaction to, to it, January 6th, I guess, right? And the reaction to it is, reminds me of Reichstag's fire, right? So, I mean, I'm not the first to have noticed this. I mean, I think many people have done. Of course, the communists have used the same, very similar, very similar strategies. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't know. I, I'm very, indeed, very worried that uh, it's very hard to fight accusation of racism. People, this is, you know, when people are accused of racism, uh, they they feel very vulnerable and they, they don't have an answer. Pe people are afraid to speak out because they would be called racist. It's a huge accusation and which is used all the time by, by the progressive, the extreme progressive left. And uh, in, indeed, it's not easy to find a solution. Except maybe to say, yeah, I am, 
he could he also call me a racist. Okay, I'm a racist. If that's what you mean by racist, I'm a racist. I don't know. I don't know if this is a solution. But somehow people have to sort of assume that they have to fight. I mean, you can't. I mean, these accusations of racist are most of the time absurd. Yeah. And, uh, and then there are accusations of white supremacists, which is also ridiculous. So every time you you defend some some of the principles of, uh, of academic freedom, of in, intellectual integrity, these are supposed not to be white things. I mean, mathemat- you know, mathematics is accused. Yeah. So I don't know if you know that they, 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 they have been start, I mean, they have been uh, proposals uh, to sort of fight against white mathematics. What the hell does it mean, white mathematics? I mean, mathematics is a universal thing that has been yeah. developed by people all over the world. I mean, uh, mathematics departments in the United States, for example, are incredibly diverse. You know, they talk all the time about diverse equity and inclusion. I mean, you know, nothing has been more diverse and more inclusive. Equity, I don't know what equity means. It's uh, because equity was supposed to mean equality, but now it means something entirely different. It means it, it means equal proportion, proportional representation. And of course, there is no proportional representation because obviously different groups behave very differently. It's not a matter of one being better than the others, but you know, the Chinese or uh, the Jews were very, very good in math because they were interested in it, not because they were superior as uh, individuals. Anyway, uh, it's it's a uh, it's a there are cultural differences which obviously lead to different different outcomes. Uh, but uh, but now everything <laughs> every every outcome which is uneven, which is unequal, it's considered to be uh, racist. So. Yeah. Mathematics it's, is, is you know white white supremacy is mathematics. I mean, it, you know, just when I hear this word, I just get get absolutely angry. It's, it's I, just absolutely absurd. Yeah, I I can understand your reaction. Uh, it's um, it, it it is hard in um in a it seems to me in in a society that kind of has enshrined as its most basic you know fundamental value the equality and dignity of each individual to uh, observe that there are uh, unequal outcomes, especially if you layer on statistics on top of everything and then you make a, a subgroup out of anyone and then maybe you you pick out subgroups in a, in a very um, interested fashion. Like for example, now you have a per- person of color. Person of color doesn't mean anything except for they're, they're not white or they're not white compared yes. to the people right. that we don't like. So, uh, yes. or, you know, uh, what was it, Pacific, Islander, uh, Asian, um, you know, these little conglomerates of people that, you know, if you were to separate them further into subgroups, you would see that the outcomes are extremely, they very widely between maybe people from, you know, Southern South Asia, or people from Southeast Asia, or people from the Pacific Islands, very, very different outcomes in many, many directions. Um, but it feels to me that contra- using that, that basic idea of equality and dignity and then overlaying this, this you know, clear inequality in, in this space that we, we found to be most salient. How much money can you make? And how, how easy it, is it for you to climb up the established ladders of success, either in politics, academia, or business, mostly in business? So can you climb up these ladders? And, and do you, are, are you going to be able to do that? Uh, and we, we see these inequalities, and they keep happening. And some of them have relative you know periodicity like you said you know some some subgroups tend to do very well in mathematics some tend to do very well in business so there's always this difference and i feel like this is going to be a perpetual cudgel it's going to be like the hammer that's going to be chipping away at uh, at the idea of equality of um opportunity that you know that obviously i, I... To leave. Can you, can you... Yeah, it, it goes against the yeah equality of opportunity is exactly equality of opportunity is of course exactly what we need and uh, what we had uh, to a large extent in American universities. Equality of outcomes is what they want, and uh, of course this will, uh, will lead to uh, even more conflict and and, uh, and unhappiness, and uh, in the end. You, Change. It will really not change anything at all, actually, to make everything worse. Because, for example, uh, uh, one way to achieve equality of outcomes is starting in, in, in schools, in 
elementary on, or high schools and deciding that the way to have everybody treated equal is to make no differences whatsoever, uh, lower the demands on the curriculum, for example, in mathematics, do less because if you do too much, there will be differences and therefore, therefore uh, mediocratize the whole subject. Uh, which of course will have a terrible effect exactly on the people that you, you are supposed to, to help. Because very often uh, the kids whose families are educated or uh, are financially better off, they find a way around it, right? So if, if the education has no content, the education at school for the kids has no content, they, they supplement the education with other things. They do a lot more at home. They, they get private teachers and so on and so forth. Or they take the kids to, private, to different schools, charter or private schools. And the ones that are going to suffer are exactly the ones that you are supposed to help. So it's really, I mean, it's a, it's, it's a completely ridiculous thing. In fact, the only way to help people uh, in disadvantaged uh, areas is, is actually to promote excellence, which is what happens. You know, I, 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 I for example, there is, uh, Yesterday, I participated in a gala e event of, uh, of uh, what are called success academies in New York City. So these are charter schools organized by Eva Moskowitz. Uh, and uh, she started about, I don't know, 15 years ago in areas of uh, Harlem and New York City's uh, broader, uh, where you have large concentrations of, of, of minorities, especially, especially Blacks. And uh, uh, she has done a fantastic job. I mean, really fantastic job at educating these kids. So, I mean, it shows that, it, you know, <laughs> with, with, good, uh, with good programs, you can educate anybody. But, but you cannot claim somehow that uh, any, as, as Candy says, so Candy is this, this guru of, uh, of uh, anti-racism in the United States nowadays. Uh, so he claims that any, any uh, any kind of uh, inequality of outcome is due to racism. So no matter what, I mean, absolutely everything is reduced to racism. So if people are not exactly at the same level in anything, if they are not proportionally represented in any activity, of course, it, it, I, I wonder what you would say about uh, sports, for example, where clearly very often in baseball or basketball, uh, blacks are represented in very high, it's very high proportion. So would, would he say that you know Chinese should be proportionally represented, or any other group should be proportionally represented in basketball, in baseball, in in whatever? Uh, it doesn't. I mean, it's. There's been it, there's been a lot of uh, chat about the the, the fetishization of, of black bodies and things like that. I'm sure there is there is some study or some social science paper written about why it is that you know we we've uh, we've got more people who who are of a particular color in sports just because you know it's uh it's 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 the white the white man fetishizing or, or some something. There is an explanation. Don't worry. Uh, Actually, my my explanation is very simple. I mean, you know, kids like success. I mean, and they are like competition and uh that's very often the only thing they have the only possibility for 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 black kids in urban uh, areas poor areas in which they are given terrible educations the only way to succeed is in sports so they do very well in sports i mean there's no other i don't think there's any other experience i mean okay you can say that there are also small, small differences between between various groups based on on their bodies and their i don't know whatever uh, but also probably very very small i would think and uh, the main differences are cultural differences and, and you know the desire of people to succeed kids want to succeed yeah do you think that there is um there's an impact made by by expectations like i know i know for example asian families are extremely you know they're well known for the for the tiger mom phenomenon where the expectations are extremely high and the children succeed extremely well but still they're failures and it's almost a, it's almost a joke to to yes. berating yeah. your children uh, and in a way we've kind of institutionalized the the opposite for for minorities that are underperforming Kind of telling them that you know not only should you not try but you know it's uh it's you're you're not going to make it anyway because you know there's this whole system of rigged against you it's nebulous and, and mysterious where exactly it's located but no worries you're you're going to fail which is it's kind of a, a bit of a crime isn't it well i mean yeah it, it, it's uh it's now 
being said directly that 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 uh, being interested uh, in, in reading books or or doing math or or being in time or doing well in school these are these are characteristics of whites not that somehow black. i mean you, you see i mean you see it in, in serious organizations like the 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 museum of uh, the museum of uh, black and african uh, the, the black and african museum in uh, new york city oh, sorry in, in washington excuse me uh, there was uh, last year there was such a there was a display of such notions that somehow certain things are just white and uh, uh, if you if you succeed if you if you succeed in certain things and anyway it's it, it's and it's uh, kind of sickening somehow that you can make distinctions between people based on color and uh, that certain things are supposed to be supposed to be white and other things are supposed to be black as well. so instead of looking for universality of things in, in, in people they look for the slightest kind of differences and then they make it uh, very difficult uh, to find the, whatever is common among be, between us. Yeah. Anyway. How much uh, do you think this is based on the fact that there is, there is power to be had, there is power to be gained by uh, kind of instrumentalizing these differences? Because, you know, once you have census statistics, once you have, you know, differences in incarceration or things like that, um, then you have a, a bit of data that you can use to then go out and um, create a narrative and um, mobilize people to secure a certain position of power for, for other people that might not necessarily be part of these communities, but that can see that there is a, a constituency behind, uh, behind inequality. There's always, you know, telling telling you that you're poorer than your neighbor, or telling you that you're more, you know, you're, you're destitute or you have no chances, and there's a, you know, there's a, a bad man behind behind the curtains pulling the strings and keeping you down. This has been a tactic of, you know, of of all sorts of political actors in the past, but it seems now that with with the internet, with the rise of, you know, video, uh, things like that, where you know, George Floyd was essentially kind of a technology led movement if there wasn't the the video capture on camera i mean you couldn't through word of mouth the whole george, george floyd story wouldn't have been able to be told in the in this effective scaled way instantly and be communicated viscerally to millions of people that that reacted on it almost immediately um so it, it feels to me like technology has a big part to play in this but also that there's a part of power where you know i'm not saying everyone is cynical that's involved in this thing i'm sure there are true believers everywhere but it is also extremely easy to wield power using these narratives oh absolutely i mean i i i think that uh, as i said many many times i think the age i i I put a lot of blame on the Democratic Party that uh, basically for the last 30, 40 years has pushed this identity politics uh, as, as a tool to gain more and more power, of course. And uh, uh, though maybe at the beginning, some of the, some of the policies uh, were reasonable, like affirmative action, say certain, certain kind of affirmative action may have been reasonable at a given time, uh, in time, it, it it just get completely out of proportion, and uh, it's it has led to more division. I mean, the country has is more divided now than ever, and uh, uh, the policies that they are pushing now is going to divide us even more. Uh, but it has benefited the democratic party. I mean, the democratic party is clearly using it as a way to keep power and to to hold and keep power. In fact, I'm, I'm right now I am extremely worried about uh, about. Uh, the fact that uh, we leave, we are at a time when the Democratic Party, and the progressive wing of the Democratic Party, let's say, is now representing just about all the institutions, important institutions of the United States, starting from the university, the media. The universities are completely dominated by, by, by liberals. And, I mean, the, the proportions are something like 98 to 2 or 
95 to 5. It depends also on the on the field, I think, in, maybe in science, in STEM. Maybe the proportion is slightly different, but in, in uh, there is an overwhelming representation of people on the left in universities, in newspapers, the journals, uh, uh, all sorts of um, uh, higher institutions, like uh, even national national academy, national academy of arts and sciences, have become extremely work. Yeah. Uh, even the military now. The military, the businesses, and so on. so. I mean, they, 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 there is a sense that they control the, the for the democratic party that now they control the, the narrative. Is as Lenin said. I mean, you know, it was very clear. But I, I think it's not just Lenin. I think it was always very clear that if you control you in order to to control power, you have to control the keeps of com the the means of communications. But the democratic party controls all the means of communications right now, uh, and. Uh, I think the consequence is that they feel empowered now to go for the kill. They can, they can, they can push a lot of a lot of policies, which, which will make it almost impossible for the oppositions to ever win. There's um, and, uh, if that's a case. That's the end of democracy. Yeah, there's there's an interesting concept in in economics called um, a preference cascade. Um, I just got uh, alerted to it by uh, by a, a different guest, and it was um, it's it's essentially the idea that um, if you if you you know your your average person will believe and act on the beliefs that they think they ought to do within a within a given society. So it's kind of they they think okay this is normal I'll be acting normal. And then they, uh, you know, they get they get some input from the outside, and when they realize that a critical mass of other people actually believe what they themselves deeply believe on the inside, not just the not just acting on what they ought to be acting, a change can happen quite fast. And then that's kind of the preference cascade. That after that critical mass of believing in um, in you know what you ought to do, and then seeing that oh, actually people believe differently. Essentially, this is. To what happened in Eastern Europe as well, where you know people didn't really know exactly how how involved other people were with the regime, uh, they they weren't aware. There were, there's always that climate of suspicion, and you know who's an informant, who's with the party. Uh, you know I'm not going to say anything to get me in trouble. But then after a, a certain critical mass, people knew okay this regime is a sham. It's it's okay to believe this different thing. It's okay to believe what I actually believe, and then things flip. Um, and I, I'm curious if this, if you think that this something like this could happen in the current environment, because obviously dissident voices, you know, they're 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 getting louder. People are talking about this. You know, this this podcast is part of part of an effort to to kind of put put more voices like that out there. Um, do you think that there there could be a, a certain critical mass where people are like, okay, it's it's safe for me to speak out about this now. It's okay to 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 own it. Yeah, this is exactly, yeah. I mean, one of the reasons I started to write articles was exactly for, for that. It, it, originally, I was trying to write things that had to do with Princeton University and, and to get more people in academia, at universities to, to really express their voice because I still believe that the vast majority of people are totally opposed to this nonsense. Uh, I, I received, in fact, a lot of, a lot of emails from people who, Sort of said that they admire what I'm doing, but they will never, never do anything like this because they are afraid of this and that and so on and so forth. So even for people who had tenure, I mean, you, you'd think that they don't have much to to fear. Uh, still, people are very, very worried, uh, and and uh, you you're absolutely right. I mean, it can happen. Uh, it can happen that. Uh, if we can get more and more people to speak, uh, this would disappear. But but you know, you know it, it's it, it's really a matter. How should I say? It, it, it's right now. I agree that the, the voices of people who oppose this nonsense uh, is increasing, and there's more and there are more and more people who really fight it. But I'm not so sure that it's proportional to what is needed. Because also it, you can also see that that somehow now with the Biden administration, with the power that the federal government has, and with the power of uh, of the uh, our major tech companies, uh, you, you know things can actually go exactly the opposite direction. Actually, it can become even harder and harder 
to express any kind of uh, opinion which is against uh, against uh, the preferred opinions of uh, of these institutions and uh, things could deteriorate i mean it, it can go either way i mean i i hope i'm an optimist and i hope you're right i, I hope that 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 uh, there will be a return to normalcy but it's also possible that things could keep could like yeah that. i think the, the the major obstacle with this is that like you said all almost all institutions are captured thoroughly by by this ideology and whatever next steps it has it has in store for us um but i think what could happen is that there could be something like a counter elite people who are who are thinking about these things deeply who are kind of incubating maybe they're not very outspoken maybe they're close to the halls of power maybe they're people who are in tech but they're not really there's for example coinbase is a very outspoken company that's now said okay there's not going to be any politics in this company as a as a matter of principle a lot of people left that's fine. The, the CEO is fine with that. A lot of people came in. That's fine as well. So there's a little bit of a realignment there. But I do think this, this has to start from the top. This has to have uh, some important figures that people can look up to and say, OK, if this, this, per this important person can be rich, can have resources, can you know, be out of jail by you know not believing in, in all the the woke uh, you know es eschatology that we're supposed to be believing in um then maybe i can i can align myself with with this a little bit better but um yeah i think it will, would have to be some some form of elite movement uh because now if if you want to be if you're a striver and everyone's supposed to be a striver now you know to try to make it in the world you know make money get get a, a respectable position you have to say yes to these dogmas there's almost you you can't get away with them after you reach a certain echelon you have to sign the papers bow to the new gods and and say your say your prayers um but yeah i'm 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 curious if you if you think that that's uh, more possible right. yeah no i think it's possible but but you, you know there is also the danger that uh, the ideas uh, of, of united states republican form of government are are just going to little by little disappear. I mean, you you, you look at uh, the, the education, education K to twelve, and of course universities also. But K to it starts in K to twelve, and uh, you you see where the trends are, and uh, it doesn't look good at all. So you know you get you 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 get millions of kids who are educated like this who don't really understand anymore the the, the form of government that, that we had. And uh, they are told all the time that uh, the United States was terrible, uh, was racist, ra still racist, colonialist, awful uh, uh, history. And uh, you, you know, even if they don't quite believe it, because little by little, of course, kids like in Romania. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> that's what my next people. point. I'm like, let them let them exaggerate, because that's when they start not believing it. Yeah, but but still, but still, it 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 leads to sort of a, a major vacuum. Right? What are they going to believe in? Right. So okay, they definitely will not believe this nonsense. I mean, little by little, obviously, more and more people are going to report it. But on the other hand, it's a there is a vacuum now. Which what? How are you going to get back to some kind of belief system? In, in, uh, the ideas of Republicans. I mean, again, I mean, I'm an optimist, and I hope I hope there is a solution to all this. Uh, but we, obviously, there are major difficulties, and in particular because of the educational system, which is awful. I mean, in, in the end, look. I mean, the universities. You know, people complain. Uh, academics always complain that they have no power, which is nonsense. I mean, we have a huge amount of power because we educate the the, the people who are going to be the leaders, uh, the people who will shape opinion. Uh, the teachers who teach kids at, at the sky, high school, the, the, the school level, K to 12. Uh, so we have an immense amount of power. And if the universities are sick, then you will have a sick society in the end. So hopefully, hopefully we'll have to do something. I mean, I think the most important thing is to do something at the level of universities. And then from the universities, you may start having some impact on everything else, in particular the media. Uh, and, and of course, uh, the school system, which has to be seriously reformed. 
Yes, I think um, there's a lot of projects now about creating uh, kind of parallel uh, systems of, of education. Um, and I think that the, the weakness of these projects is that even if they deliver extremely high grade education, you know, the, of the likes of Princeton, Sanford and, and whatever Ivy League you want to mention, um, the problem is that these these universities are principally um, credentialing functions. They they are branding your children with um, the the laurels of a of a good life. They're they're telling you, okay, this is this is a part of the elite, and they can now get an elite job at an elite institution. Yeah, um, right. Yeah, and to, to me, do you think that this this um, hurdle this can can be overcome by any sort of new institution, or will Will the Princeton of a hundred years from now still be still be you know an extremely good brand? It's a it's a it's a very good question, and I hear more and more people talking about uh, starting new institutions. Yeah, I mean, uh, I I part of uh, I, I I don't participate very much, but I, I I get bombarded with with emails from a group of people uh, in essentially in computer science. Uh, and they have very interesting discussions about what to do, and, uh, and they observe exactly the sort of things that, that we all observe, and they want to do something about it. And particularly, they talk about now they talk a lot about creating new universities. But it's very difficult. I mean, it's very difficult to create a new university. It's extraordinarily expensive, and uh, uh, you know how are you going to get good faculty? Uh, I mean, it's a huge amount of money. But maybe I, I my my hope there are lots of rich people now. Uh, there is a lot of inequality. I mean, let's use the inequality <laughs> of the last, I don't know, 50 years. Let's use it for good use. But, but unfortunately, a lot, a lot of the money comes from the left. Still. I mean, a lot of very rich people are actually giving money to nonsense on the left. Yeah, it's indulgences as well. Including, yeah. you know, Soros, for example. Yeah, exactly. Could, I, I can't understand. He comes from Hungary. I don't understand at all what motivates him. I don't know. He's he's a, a kind of a quintessential like Promethean person. He thinks that he can uh, export he can. reason and equality. I mean, I can I can kind of understand the the mindset of someone like that. If this is obviously the the best perspective, I, I I'm giving him all the credit in the world. No conspiracy theories, no no Satanism or anything. Um, if if oh, someone's I... animated by that that spirit, I could understand why he's funding these things. You know, this this kind of idea of of you know rational man that he wants to export everywhere in the world sounds sounds great on one level i don't buy it but he seems well, to... i mean communism, communism also sounded great right and it was uh, communism also for lots of people it sounded great and it had terrible terrible impact it still sounds I mean, it's, great it's, <laughs> for a lot of people it is sounds great right a lot of people yeah exactly i mean it's a, it's the same story but for somebody coming from hungary like he is it's hard to understand Right. I mean, it's hard to understand. Uh, so, of course, I, I don't know. He, he, he believes in this open society, what he calls open societies. I, I don't quite understand what they are, given given his policy. I mean, I understand what an open society is, but I think he's pushing exactly for the opposite of what they think to be an, an open society. But anyway, I'm, I'm, I just don't understand somebody like that. But anyway, we need people like this on, on the right who, who are will, willing to to start new universities or new institutions that that would defend would defend the republicanism and uh, and uh, academic freedom and freedom to speech and, and uh, integrity intellectual integrity. I mean, to me, the most important thing is intellectual integrity. Right? The fact that people are not lying. <laughs> I mean, or they're not afraid to say things. Yeah. I mean, this is absurd. That United, I, I never thought that I would see that in the United States that people would be afraid to speak freely. About what they believe in. Yeah, I mean, how... me, that was that, that was the United States that I was dreaming. When yeah. I was in Romania, that's what I was dreaming for. I was dreaming for exactly that kind of country where people people can speak freely about. Yeah, about... It seems like you you personally have an investment in this because you've kind of lived through the opposite as well. Um, how how does your does your leaving Romania and your experience with communism kind of reflect on this? Uh, you know, I, I, it definitely raises the stakes a little bit. But if you can tell me a bit about that, like how did you you, you left during kind of the height of communism? It was it was pretty hard to leave. Yes. Like, what right. what was the story so there as well? <laughs> yeah, no, it's interesting. I, actually, I had very interesting uh, very interesting education in Romania. I mean, in the sense that. 
I was coming from a communist family, actually. My, my, both my parents were Jewish and we saw a lot of anti-Semitism, suffered quite a lot. My, my father was a student of uh, medicine in Yash. He was forced to stay in the back of the class. He was beaten up uh, being Jewish. My mother couldn't go to high school in the 1930s. She wanted very much to study and she couldn't. And she had this, this problem with it all her life. She was complaining about the fact that she wanted to study and she couldn't. Anyway, so, uh, so they, my father certainly became attracted, uh, became a communist sympathizer and, and uh, was in prison from 1940 to 1944. Uh, actually met a lot of a lot of uh, leaders of the Communist Party, so I presume that played a role. He, he was not politically very involved, he was more like the doctor of the community. But in any case, he later on, uh, he studied medicine, uh, went to, to Russia, to Soviet Union actually, and, and got a degree, a high level degree in medicine. But of course, uh, uh, as a kid, I, I was growing up with these heroic myths about Soviet Union and, you know, how reading all sorts of books about great heroes, uh, how they were building the best possible society, fighting against vicious reactionaries, and so on and so forth. The Soviet Union was a paragon of all possible virtues, and I remember, this is one of the my, my <laughs> most... Uh, sort of defining uh, experiences. I was seven or eight when uh, I was absolutely shocked the first time in my life that I heard somebody or my kids criticizing Soviet Union. And I, I thought, how can you? <laughs> I mean, a Soviet Union was supposed to be the paragon of all possible virtues. Uh, how could somebody even, I mean, even the notion that somebody could say something negative, it seems so bizarre to me that it, it really transformed me. So I, I, from then on, I started to constantly see how I can disprove it. <laughs> that there was nothing wrong with Soviet Union. And I was constantly listening to conversations about it. And uh, at home, uh, my brother was older than me, would challenge all sorts of nonsense that you'd hear in, in school. And then we had discussions with the parents and my father would get upset because it was, uh, my, my brother was challenging him in, in his beliefs. And uh, my father would get angry, would say, well, okay, but, uh, you know, whatever it is now, it's still much better than it was in the past. <laughs> this was a typical answer that you'd hear. Uh, and uh, so little by little, I, I started to realize all the lies and all the terrible things of the system. And, and uh, it was interesting because my father went through the same process. I mean, he himself, actually, he became probably this, this illusion already in Soviet Union when he was studying, but, but he, wouldn't, uh, he wouldn't quite say it. Uh, but uh, he saw a lot of terrible things during the last years of Stalin, in fact, in, in Soviet Union. And uh, uh, later on, when I was 16, 17, 18, I would listen to him at Free Europe uh, and we'll discuss about, uh, what, about uh, so he was already, I mean, we were on the same, on the same uh, wavelengths. At, by that time. And I became involved in all sorts of, I, I, I'm, I'm a pretty much of a, I guess I was a rebel at that time too. And I'm now a little bit, <laughs> but uh, uh, I, we started to organize with other kids, all sorts of uh, discussion groups and we'll, we'll, we'll read the uh, reactionary books like Plato and Aristotle <laughs> and so on and so forth. <laughs> right, so we, we were interested in philosophy. And uh, uh, so, uh, so, you know, little by little, I became totally, of course, completely, completely, uh, desilu not desillusion, desillusion is not the right word. I, I became disgusted with a, with a system which was totally based on lies. Um, so, uh, uh, well, books, of course, were extremely important, right? So I read, I could read, which was interesting. I mean, given that it's big books, of course, I was not translated in Romania. I, I, I read this Darkness at Noon. I don't know if you know Artus Kersler. It was, it was really a remarkable yeah. book. Yeah, uh, it's a great book. About the stunning show trials. And uh, I mean, they had a huge impact on me. And uh, Orwell's, of course, Animal Farm in 1984. And uh, have in, in Romanian, did you find uh, in Darkness at Noon in Romanian back then? 
No, no, in, in French or in French. I, I would read in French, basically. So uh, was some is that right? I mean, was, uh, of was, course. <laughs> It's not it's certainly not translatable, of course, but uh, uh, they had tremendous impact on me. And uh, uh, so I, yeah, we even organized some demonstrations, uh, some small demonstrations, which were my family thought that I was totally crazy. I did other crazy things like uh, that I could be thrown out of university. But in any case, I, I changed quite a lot. And uh, uh, I became a mathematician. In mathematics, also, by the way, uh, I was good at it, but at the same time, it, it was one space uh, which was immune to the party ideology that, uh, that I could find. So it was intellectual, an island of intellectual honesty. Uh, yeah, was, and was uh, mathematics the, the way you, you found to, to, to leave? Was that an opportunity for you to, to go to the U.S. to study, or it was certainly it was certainly, but I, yeah, but I was deeply attracted by by mathematics. I mean, I I couldn't imagine doing anything else but math. Though who knows? But if I was educated in the United States, maybe I would have done something. Maybe, I don't know. Maybe I would have yeah, become... gender studies or something. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's true. <laughs> anyway, so. Uh, uh what were the lessons i mean you were asking me something about how that influenced me first of all i i realized that uh from the experience of my past uh, my parents who were sincerely attracted by the ideology of communism when they were young uh i realized that uh you know first, first of all how the best of intention can lead to terrible consequences which is something that i think people in people in the West should learn. Uh, I don't think they, they've been told enough about this, how something can look very good on paper or uh, and very attractive, and at the same time, it can have terrible consequences. Uh, societies which sacrifice freedom in the name of equalities are usually doomed to get absolutely none. They don't get uh, freedom, but they also don't take quality because uh, the co communism in particular, as I knew it, produce not only a very unfree society, but also one in which poverty, exploitation, and a new form of inequ inequity, inequality, which was very insidious, with a small elite of party members at the top enjoying enormous privileges relative to the rest. So we, we ourselves were rather privileged. We are not at the top, but we are certainly privileged. I mean, my family is I mean, it's former communist, you can imagine. Even though my father was a, was a doctor, he was not, politically involved, but, uh, but nevertheless, we had a lot of privileges by relative to the rest of society. Of course, people at the top had even more. Uh, totalitarian society, another thing that uh, I learned and I, I think people should be told, totalitarian, totalitarian societies are extremely efficient at selecting the worst people to leadership positions. Either a small number of fanatical believers at the beginning maybe of revolutions, there are such people, who are very fanatical and they, they forget about the reality and they, in the name of their ideologies, they can do whatever. Uh, or legions of activists, apparatchiks, informers, security apparatus, people who uh, are opportunists, dishonest, hypocritical, uh, and, uh, cowards, and often vicious, uh, and also intellectually mediocre. I mean, Hayek was in Road to Slavery has a very nice discussion about how how totalitarian society produces this type of people. Uh, I think it's extremely interesting, and I think something that people in the West don't realize. And you see, of course, this happening now in the United States. I mean, you see that the people who are promoted in positions of power in this atmosphere of uh, of wokeism, people who are, are are exactly the ones who are opportunists and cowards. Uh, you see that you know leaders or everywhere uh, of various institutions who are just either a believer and in that case they are fanatical because they believe in things which are completely unreasonable, or they are just uh, just opportunistic and and, uh, and cowards. Anyway, and you see that everywhere. I mean, presidents of almost all universities now are like this. There are very few. There are some exceptions, but few. Totalitarian society also produces schizophrenic reality between uh, what is official and what is personal. 
the official reality of Ceausescu's Romania with uh, you know, this constant celebration of all these hard, all these wonderful things that we are doing. The real reality was that of experience of interminable lines for food or the most basic supply, the arbitrariness and stability of uh, bureaucrats, armies of bureaucrats, the pervasiveness, pervasiveness of the police and security forces, informants everywhere, the tired and beaten faces of people on the streets and so on and so forth. So anyway, so uh, this more or less are the kind of things that uh, I got and uh, they served me very well, by the way. I mean, I think one of the reasons I was able to to adapt well in the, in, in the West is because I was, uh, I was vaccinated against all this nonsense that, that many people now believe in. Yes, absolutely. And it's, it also gives you a, a sense of appreciation for anything that manages to not be that, obviously, up to this point where it's slowly morphing into, into that. Um, I'm, I'm curious what your relationship is to Romania at the moment. Have you have you been back much? Do you have any relationship to, to the old country? Have you uh, maybe checked on your on your uh, file? Have you been to the uh, to the Securitate files to see if? Yeah, no. Oh, but 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 before uh, before uh, maybe, maybe I should say something else uh, also uh, relative to what I was saying earlier which is also important so you know it's another thing that that when people are pressured to conform uh they and that of course we, we saw a lot in communism they pretend to conform while allowing themselves the freedom to think whatever they please and uh the get on and zin free right i mean that's uh, uh -huh. the motto and uh, uh was interesting also to see, and of course, again, it's a lesson that people in the West should learn, should learn, is that whenever they are allowed to speak freely and they are not forced anymore, like in, say, in Romania immediately after, and in, in all communist countries, in fact, in Eastern Europe, after the fall of communism, there was this incredible you know, uh, going back to, to uh, all sorts of things that the, the communism was supposed to uh, to uh, liberate us from. So there was uh, a, a, a huge explosion of uh, of uh, ethnic conflict between various groups of people, and uh, you know, even though the communism was supposed to teach us to 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 be very. Uh, accepting of all possible groups. And anyway, I mean, I just wanted to say that this, this is not so important. Now you're telling me about Romania. So you ask me about relations with Romania and Eastern Europe. In all honesty, I don't have that much. I mean, I still have a lot of friends and I'm still very happy when I go there. I was there two years ago, uh, at, at, at the 50th anniversary of uh, my finishing high school. So this is, uh, um, it was a, a bittersweet moment, of course, because uh, well, first of all, you know, a lot of years have passed, but at the same time, you still realize that you have a lot of common with lots of people. I didn't think that it would be as nice as it was. That's why I, I just like Bucharest. I thought it was much better than it used to be. Yeah. So I, it was very enjoyable. But it, it, and of course, I, I still have people, friends, and so on. But I don't uh, know much about what's going on politically. For example, I'm too maybe too absorbed by first of all mathematics, and second, if I'm to do some kind of interest in some politics, I, I was too absorbed by what's happening in the United States yeah. to pay that much attention to, to Europe. But I, I, I know that lots of interesting things are happening. I understand actually that the new mayor of Bucharest is a is a mathematician. Um, could be, to be honest. I, I haven't, <laughs> I don't know who the new mayor of Bucharest is. Okay. I'm, I'm very far away from Bucharest and my, my involvement right. so with, with global world. politics. Yeah, completely, right. completely. Transylvania, you know, we used to be a different country. <laughs> so. Of course, of course. Of course. My, my wife tells me all the time that, the, you know, she, she, she keeps telling me that the, the, the real nice part of Romania is Transylvania. Ah, it's, it's we are barbarians. We in the eastern in the eastern part. We are barbarians. Ah, I, I don't know. She's joking. She's joking, but 
there's there's always a tension um you know some people say that you know bucharest is the, the true crown of uh of uh you know romania but then there's these little towns in eastern uh in, in western romania and transylvania that are a bit different it's it's just different i think you know, bucharest is a, is a beautiful place as well and that's that's kind of where the magic happens in this country that's the, the big motor of of the economy and all sorts of things and intellectual life as well I've... but Yeah, Cluj is also pretty good. Timisoara, yeah, you know. And the center Cluj is actually very nice now. I haven't, uh, I haven't. Well, I've been only once in Cluj actually, uh, about ten years ago maybe. But uh, I, yeah, I, Cluj I is is very good. It's it's also I think probably after Bucharest, almost close to Bucharest, the the biggest university town. They have about two hundred thousand university students. Yeah. So it's it's. Kind Orada, of and, I, and you know, my my wife constantly wants me to go to Orada because you know she's in love with Orada. She yeah, it's, it's so nice. It's it's all renovated. I mean, all renovated. Um, true, mostly. Like... Yeah, it's, yeah, it's yeah, much yeah, yeah. No, I like it. But, uh, it's a very no Transylvania is very nice actually. I agree. Transylvania is nicer. Uh, And, uh, of course, Bucharest is something else. Bucharest is a special place, but uh, yeah, but uh, the western part of Romania is, is, seems to be more more beautiful. Yeah, yeah, we're we're not going to get into a <laughs> beauty competition. Um, you've also written about uh, the Solzhenitsyn's Harvard address, the uh, yes. world split apart, and I, I found that address really really interesting and. Um, There's um, there's one one passage in, in that piece that I want to kind of read to you. That this is a, a quote from from your piece in Colette about it. Um, in in the absence of reason, faith may lead us astray, but reason without faith seems often to run in circles, sterile and incapable of making choices. Um, I was really struck by this passage because I think this this reflects what Solzhenitsyn was saying in the address as well. Um, that you know the. The, the West is on, on a collision course with, with chaos and it's, it's losing faith, it's losing courage, uh, it's kind of eroding its own values, it's kind of in a self-consuming loop. Um, and I'm, I'm curious what your relationship is to, to faith. You know, you're a mathematician, you're obviously, you know, at the pinnacle of STEM, you're a man of science in, in many ways, you know, the reason, reason incarnate, uh, but um, you seem to have a relationship with faith. You know, what, why is faith important? Is it a necessary ingredient? Uh, yeah, it's uh, right. I, I mean, it's, a, it's, it's difficult to say. Uh, I mean, it, it's difficult to talk about these things, but let me try. So, um, uh, so, first of all, okay, you can talk about it at a personal level, at, uh, at a political level, and uh, scientific so let's say in connection with science so uh, at a, from a scientific point of view at a personal level in terms of what i believe uh it's much easier to say what i'm not uh i'm not a believer in either dialectic materialism in the sense of marx and Lenin, which uh, i can tell you a story about this a little later or scientific materialism in the sense of the so-called uh, new atheists like uh, Dawkins or Hitchens or Dennett and uh, Hawking, according to whom there is a permanent war between science and religion. Uh, and in fact, uh, yeah, so talking about dialectic materialism, uh, the story I have is that uh, is what made me uh, uh, become opposed to scientific materialism. And it, it, it had a lot to do with my growing up in Romania. Uh, so I remember as a kid, uh, my brother was older than me and, and I, I wanted to read some philosophy. So I opened his book on, on dialectic materialism. We, we had to learn such things. There was a, a book which was called, I think, Dialectic Materialism or something like that. And uh, uh, it, it was really in the sense of, dogmas of uh, Marx, Engels, and many. And I, and I remember that uh, uh, what struck me at the time, and I was only 15, maybe 14, uh, yeah, maybe 14, what struck me is that uh, there was a definition of, of uh, objective reality, of mat material reality, which was that everything that existed outside consciousness. <laughs> and then a definition of consciousness, which was saying that consciousness is the highest 
highest uh, manifestation of uh, of organization of matter. So I mean the the yeah, pretty the circular. Yeah. To, the, you know, it, it really struck me as something that I, I remember until today. And uh, it actually uh, made me start looking for other things. And that's how I got into Plato and, uh, and uh, you know, Greek philosophy and, and uh, modern philosophy and so on and so forth. Uh, so in any case, uh, the, the scientific materialism in my opinion, so th th this is sort of the new scientific materialism, which is not dialectic materialism, which was a little, it's pretty absurd, but uh, but this one, the scientific materialism is, is really dominant in science today. I mean, most scientists, maybe with the exception of mathematicians, mathematicians tend to be less materialistic because because mathematics is is by definition something where you deal with with the mind, you deal with uh, with uh, objects of the mind. Uh, so people tend to be actually quite plat. I mean, many mathematicians tend to be more sort of platonists than. than uh, materialist in, in this sense. Uh, anyway, scientific materialism, in my opinion, is totally incapable of answering the big questions, despite the fact that they claim that they can, which are the origin of life, why there is something rather than nothing, the immense complexity of living things, uh, the origin of consciousness, and so on and so forth. And I, I want to add to this mystery. So, you know, we are surrounded by mystery, of course. These questions, uh, nobody has an answer to these questions, and I don't think, I'm not even sure we'll ever have. Uh, probably not, uh, but I would add to this mystery, to this list of mysteries, one which is very rarely discussed, which uh, is what Eugene Wigner calls the unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics in the physical sciences. So, which is, is the fact that uh, abstract mathematical models, which are really objects of the mind, right? I mean, you know, you write on a piece of paper, you write some equations, uh, and you. Uh, you think about, I mean, they are clearly objects of the mind in the sense that, that they are as abstract as they can be. And yet they have this enormous impact uh, as, uh, in, in the sciences, right? The abstract mathematical models turn out to be exactly what is needed, exactly at the heart, uh, the essence of our most successful physical theory is, in my opinion, a mystery as big as any other one. And again, it's something that, that uh, scientific matter, scientific matter, does not does not get even close to to uh, deal with it. So as a consequence, uh, what am I? Uh, am I religious? Well, I'm certainly not a materialist. Uh, uh, and uh, in the end, I believe that we are surrounded by a deep and fascinating mystery, and uh, that is a terrain on which faith of various types really operates. Yeah. It's. Uh, you know, we are surrounded by this. So what is common with all of us is that definitely you are surrounded by this. I mean, the fact that you are scientific, that, you know, you have a scientific education does not mean that you don't see mystery. On the contrary, I think, I think the, the more you know about science, the more mysteries you find. Uh, so they, there's been this very interesting metaphor of, uh, of uh, relation between, between knowledge and what we know by science and, and what we don't know, the, the mystery that surrounds us. So it's a little, so it, it, the, the metaphor is that what we know is like a circle that keeps expanding, but it expands in an infinite plane. Mm -hmm. And the relationship between known and unknown is a boundary of the circle. And of course, as we know more and more, the boundary gets bigger and bigger also, which means that the, the sentiment of mystery is also increased. So this is, you know, uh this is uh something that uh, i feel explains reasonably well somehow what is going on i mean the more we know the more mysteries we discover and uh, so it's, it's by no means uh, the fact i mean the, the notion that somehow science explains everything is ridiculous it's just not true in fact the more we know the more are we, the more uh we yeah should uh I, I really like this uh, kind of visual metaphor of the the ever expanding circle in an infinite plane because yeah it's uh, it, it kind of sets sets a hard limit you know the infinity limit on what we can what we can potentially understand um, and but at at the moment I see that uh, a, a, like you said a lot of the the West is kind of gripped by this idea of scientific materialism up to the point that it seems very cultish 
it seems that a lot of people believe in science. You know, we are even told to believe the science, you know, yes. we'll write it with a big S. Science is, is our new God and we, we live by its decrees. Um, to me, that seems very hubristic. It seems very dangerous to, to think about science that way. Um, do you think that this is because of there, there was a void in any sort of other faith tradition or everything else kind of fell out of favor and now we we have this this miraculous technology that has been delivering miracles it's you know it's it's more miraculous than anything we've ever seen um it's based on science we might not know how a how a microwave works but it does work it's down in the kitchen i can point to it it delivers miracles every day um and maybe you know the the, the church hasn't been able to do that so do you think that there is a connection there between Oh. Yeah, no, definitely. No, no de de definitely. I mean, you know, this kind of, I mean, science is science and, and, and this kind of uh, scientific materialism is a religion. So, you, you, you know, science cannot explain. There are these huge mysteries that are beyond the boundaries of what we know and don't know. And uh, science cannot in any way explain these sort of things. So whenever it, it, it pretends to explain it, it's a religion. So, so I view scientific materialism as a religion or anything else. I mean, it's supposed to be based on science, but it goes beyond science because it, it, it addresses issues which really cannot be addressed by what we know today in science. Uh, and every time you go in the realm of what is actually still very, very mysterious, you can only, uh, you, you have to tread very carefully and, Otherwise, you, you create another dogmatism, and that's a, a, a very dangerous dogmatism because, in in the end, it will definitely undermine any other form of religion. But it creates another religion, which is uh, equally dangerous, actually, and maybe not as maybe not as uh, I, I don't view. I, I don't know. I, I mean, to me, the. the important religions are based on texts which are very inspiring, right? You read the Bible or, I don't know, for the Quran uh, for the Muslims or, or uh, the Indians uh, or the Buddha have their own text. And they're usually extremely inspiring. They're poetically inspiring. They're, they're, they're much more uh, made commensurate with what people need than this kind of dogmatic scientific materialism. So I, I think that scientific materialism, in my opinion, is very dangerous, actually. I, yeah. I don't like it at all. Again, this is not science. I mean, science is great. I mean, everything that's yeah. through science. But science operates in, into a certain real in which you can actually make experiments. You can you can see whether you talk nonsense or not. You can be challenged and so on and so forth. When you start operating outside the realm of of, of what uh, is noble and what, what we know and what can be known, uh, then it's it's dogmatism as any other dogmatism, and it's not particularly pretty. I mean, it's, uh, yeah, and and people course. keep speaking about the the scientific consensus in different fields, which I mean, you as a as someone who's actually as active in science, you know that this is there is very rarely a consensus on anything. Of course, really. it's wrong. I mean, it's completely wrong. I mean, look, people forget that at the time when uh, when Galileo Galilei. Uh, really challenge the church by by saying that you know the, the earth is moving around the sun. Uh, nobody believed. I mean, the, the ninety nine percent of all the scientists at the time, so the consensus, in other words, was against it. And he had to, you know, he had to go against the consensus. The same thing happened with all the great scientists. At some point, they have to go against the consensus. Anything new is based on a new consensus which has to be created by people who are very courageous and and who are very ins insightful and courageous mm -hmm. and that's what happened with, with and, darwin also da darwin also the same thing but uh, yeah, at the yeah. time when when he expressed his views it was very unpopular the consensus was very different so the, whenever i hear consensus i i just i i just don't like i mean the same thing is happening in climate change you know there's always this consensus scientific consensus it's nonsense it's not true i know a lot of people who don't believe at all in the scientific consensus about climate change a lot of serious people <clears throat> Uh, but yeah. the newspapers tell us all the time that you know, you know, who, whoever does not believe in the consensus is is crazy or it's uh, uh, it's uh, I don't know. 
Yeah, and, and even in, in the deepest science, I think, you know, even when you think about, you know, general relativity or, or you know, huge theories, you know, even, even Newtonian uh, physics, these are essentially kind of flashes of, of insight that come sometimes from places that are, it's not like, you know, Einstein was building up, you know, since he was three years old, uh, you know, equation by equation up to the point where he progressively got to this insight. He got to this insight maybe through through means that were not necessarily as, as logical as, you know, just thinking of course. through a problem. Of course, of course, of course. I, I, I said it in, in my article on Solzhenitsyn, and I actually say that, that uh, the way people imagine mathematics is sort of the most rational, the most logical of all sciences, right? And, and everything, whenever you read a mathematical text, it's completely logical from A to Z, right? I mean, it, there is no jump. Everything, in fact, it, it, it's part of uh, the professional ethos, ethos of mathematics that everything has to be completely justified, uh, you know, you know have proofs, complete proofs, and so on. Uh, but of course, that does not mean that when you actually do the, when you practice the science of mathematics, when you actually prove a new theorem, uh, it, it's the process of getting a new theorem is completely different. I mean, you start with a with a leap of faith also. You start with a leap of faith, you believe that something is true uh, based on faith, and then start little by little to start to, uh, to actually get the backbones of the, the theorem that's going to prove. So at the end, it looks like it's a perfect uh, edifice, uh, completely logical, but in reality, there are lots of leaps of faith that you do when you actually construct this edifice. Uh, and uh, of course, the same thing in, 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 in any other science, in physics and so on and so forth. You, you know, people have this, in, this, I don't know, some incredibly insights that appear, you know, there are lots of stories like this, that, that people think about the problem for a very long time, uh, they cannot solve it, and all of a sudden they have somehow after, of course you have to, you have to actually try many times and think about it for hours and hours, and all of a sudden you have this insight, this incredible flash of, that, that happens in your mind. Well, it's another mystery. How, how does these things happen? I have no idea. Nobody has. But to claim otherwise is nonsense. I mean, to claim that somehow everything is based on logic is completely nonsensical. It's just not true. That's not how scientists operate. Yes. And again, you are absolutely right about the consensus. I mean, I'm totally again. I mean, I don't like the notion of consensus. I mean, of course, consensus occurs, but it should not be, you should not. You should not be able to shut out people by telling them, well, the consensus is like this and, you know, we don't believe you. If you have something interesting to say, say it. And then, you know, it could be that the consensus is wrong. It has happened so many times in science. Yeah. In fact, think... every time there is something new. In fact, every time there is something new, that's how it happens. I mean, there is a consensus, somebody challenges, and then little by little, that consensus, the whole consensus disappears and you have something new. Yeah, there's uh, the saying that uh, science uh, advances uh, funeral by funeral or something something similar like that, that when, when one generation of scientists <laughs> dies out, then the next to next generation yes, yes, with, the, with, their, yeah, with right. their new, new consensus right. can, right. can pop up and, and populate it. Yeah, but to shut up, to shut up people uh, based on consensus is just absurd. And of course, this is happening now in medicine with, uh, with uh, coronavirus, right? There's, uh, or CCCP uh, virus, if you want. Yeah, to exactly. Uh, and uh, you, you know, again, I mean, people are being shut up based on the notion of but a consensus as like this. So the consensus is 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 really uh, just a metaphor for for uh, telling people to shut up. Uh, yeah, follow, it's a, it's a metaphor for power because the consensus at the beginning, the WHO consensus was that masks don't do anything, uh, you shouldn't wear masks. Yes. Then the consensus right. shifted towards everyone needs to wear a mask forever. So it's, uh, it's yeah. 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 Right, exactly. And, you, you know, you still see people outside. I mean, you know, I mean, it's just so sad. You see people outside, beautiful. Uh, there are not that many people around and they wear masks or they go on bicycles with masks. Yeah. Kids of two years old outside with masks. Well, yeah, there was, the there was a, recently in the news, there was a, a girl who uh, was doing 800 meters uh, uh, running 800 meters and uh, collapsed at the end because she had a mask. 
Uh, yes. I, mean, I would you need a mask when you run for 800 meters to outside to have a mask? It's a, I mean, totally absurd. It, yeah. It, yeah, yeah, no, I mean, it's, really it's, it's frightening. It's frightening how people, how, I mean, on one hand, this business of power that you say, right, that, that it's an exercise in power, and at the same time to see the, how frightened people are about uh, speaking up against, uh, against this mandate. Yeah, yeah, I think it's, they want to signal that, you know, they're, they're caring people, they, they, they want to protect their fellow man. Uh, and they also, there's also a position a bit of, of moral authority. And some people just crave that, you know, whenever you give them the opportunity to, to exercise some form of, of moral censor on, on other people, there's some personality types that thrive in that they just, you know, yes. They, yes. they want to and be again, the enforcer. And again, yeah, I didn't think I was naive. I didn't think I would see that in the United States, but of course you see it as much. I mean, the same humans type are people, universal. Universal. The same type of people that you saw in Romania doing these things that you say are doing exactly. You get the same kind of people here in the states. So, yes. so tough life. I mean, fortunately, I mean the only thing is that we had the culture in the United States. There was this culture of, uh, of uh, you know, civic culture. Uh, of republic or constitutionalism and so on, but which now they seem uh, very treat. So I'm not sure. Yeah, it it stands no chance to the to the radicals. I think you've you've mentioned this uh this this uh, quote by Yoram Hazoni. He's he's scheduled to come on the podcast as well. Um, about kind of the the devolution of 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 liberalism into you know being kind of exposed to radicalism, then moving into yes. Marxism, and then full blown communism if you're not careful. Yeah, exactly. It, it because and yeah, he, he points out the fact that sort of liberals don't are not able to confront uh, radicals because in a sense the radicals use the same kind of language as they do. And therefore, uh, they don't. They are not prepared to to answer. They they feel on the defensive, and they they constantly give in. And yeah, and uh, also I mean, kind of it's a dance. You're... Yeah, he calls it the dance of uh, between the liberal and the, uh, the yeah and the Marxist. Yeah, if you if you kind of have this, uh, you know, like we were saying before, kind of without a faith basis, uh, you know, the definition of, of equal, you know, e you're equal in the eyes of God, you know, if there's no God, you're not equal in the eyes of anyone, you know, you have dignity, what does dignity mean if there is no, there's no underlying substructure that you can define it against, you know, is dignity being a millionaire, maybe if I if I have sub millionaire status, I, I would feel like my life is undignified. You know, there's there's very it's very hard to measure these things. And then if a radical comes in and says, okay, you know, inequality in itself is undignified. Well, you know, where where where's your measuring stick? There is none. Yeah, no, it's it's absolutely true. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I, I won't keep you much longer. I have one question that I ask everyone on the show, uh, and it's uh, about your favorite subversive thinker if you have someone that you know was an inspiration to you or or someone that you've learned a lot from either a book it could be a mathematician i mean maybe that's a bit too complex for, for my my regular viewership but um you know so, someone that you you feel inspired by well in science certainly uh newton einstein this kind of people had an enormous amount of courage and uh, intellectual honesty uh, and uh, of course, insights uh, in otherwise uh, in politics. I mean, you're asking in general. Well, I, I think that's good in enough. General. Right? Yeah, I mean, it's just typically it's it's a subversive thinker. But to be honest, Einstein and Newton were very subversive at, at their time. So I think, you know, they definitely qualify as a as subversive thinkers. Yeah, yeah, no, I mean, all the all the great scientists were pretty subversive at their times. And, uh, you, you know, but by the way, we're talking about uh, scientific, uh, scientific materials. Uh, people forget that the 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 beginning of science. I mean, now it's easy to see that science is very useful, right? So it's easy to see that we need to promote it. But let's say in the in the 16th century, uh, when really European science science started, it wasn't. There was no reason to think that science is going to be very useful uh, to anybody. Uh, and uh, 
it was intimately tied to religion, actually. I mean, the, the, original, the original scientists, big scientists, were very much influenced by, by um, sort of religious beliefs. Kepler is a, a, a great example of that. I mean, he was a mystic. Uh, writing poems to God uh, when what he, yeah. he felt that he discovered discovered the, the real meaning of the universe. And, yeah, New Newton and, as well. Newton, 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 yeah. Newton was like this. Also, a sort of Copernicus was a man of the church. I mean, uh, again, faith played a major, major role in the development of science at the beginning. Now it's harder to see because because uh, everybody knows that science is useful now so okay you, you're going to support it anyway but at that time uh, the fact that you would go into science uh, and you would sacrifice many other possibilities that you had to achieve uh, to achieve uh, you know, power or financial uh, become rich or whatever uh, that, that was that required a real sacrifice i mean it required a real belief in science anyway yeah, no, but I, again, Einstein, Galileo Galilei, uh, of course, uh, I can take musicians like Beethoven. Uh, that, uh, yeah. Yeah, we, we've, we've had all sorts of people as a response to this question. Even video game designer, apparently, is a subversive thinker. So. Oh, is that so? <laughs> yeah, so yeah. we've yeah. It's well, very broad. It just shows that. I it just shows that I'm not particularly broad in terms of. Uh... No, I think it's I think it's good. You know, most people say something from you know maybe yeah this century or something, but I think you know going going back historically is a, is a good move. You know, there's just I, there's been quite a few subversive thinkers that uh, that haven't been mentioned, so uh, I think this is a good a good lineup. Yes. Yeah. Well, you, that, that in itself was subversive in a certain sense, but I am you know. I mean, I, I wouldn't take Darwin as so much of an example because I maybe I don't know maybe because I, I I'm, I'm easier to uh, judge between mathematics and physics like Einstein and Kepler yeah. and, and, and Galileo. Galileo was a remarkable person. Yeah, this is your domain. Well, thank you so yes. much uh, for, for joining me today. Is there um, a place where people can, can read more of your essays? I know you have an essay in Newsweek, the, the Princeton one. If you're publishing more, is there a place where I can point people to, to read more of your of your work? Uh, yeah, so I don't know. I have about, uh, let's see, I have now about 10 uh, articles that I wrote, uh, which are not mathematical. Mm -hmm. But I don't know how to do it. I mean, I can send it to you if. Uh, yeah, I mean, or... I can I can list the ones that I that I have read. I know you've published in Quillette and you've published in Newsweek. Um, I think typically. The New Republic also. Uh, so, yeah, the, Republic. Right, the, the not not the New Republic. The, the, the National Review. National Review. Okay, perfect. Well, I'll I'll list the ones that I can find in in the show notes. Um, and yeah, I mean, this, this was a, a, a big pleasure and uh, I'm, I'm really happy you, you joined me today. Well, it was a great pleasure to talk to you.